Good morning. We're going to begin in Isaiah chapter 5. I mean, sorry, uh, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5. Um, and uh, before we start studying Isaiah, uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. If you will, pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you now truly grateful to be called your children and to have your word in front of us. We pray that you'll bless us in this study. Pray that we'll have open hearts and that not only will we look at your word, but that we will seek application to our own lives, that we will seek to fulfill your will for us, and that we will glorify you by our words, thoughts, and actions. We're so thankful that we can be here and meet this place, and again, we're thankful that we can open up our, our Bibles and see your word, and uh, that uh, you will reveal your truth to us um, through your son and through your word. Pray that you'll be with us in this study now, and we pray this in your son Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're jumping in uh, a section into a section, um, so we're going to test your memory and see... Um, if you're following along as we, in this study, we uh, are talking about uh, the uh, uh, King Ahaz, a king in what, what part? Who, who is King Ahaz king of? Judah. So we have uh, uh, King Ahaz, uh, king in, in Judah. And then we have, uh, in this context, uh, going back to chapter 7, we have uh, the Israelites, and they join forces with the Syrians, and uh, they go to attack King Ahaz. What is their intent in attacking the king of Judah? What are they planning to do? What do they want to do? You're right. That, yeah, they want to take over that, his, his rule um, and replace him with their, their puppet, puppet uh, king, um, Tabeel. And, um, and it seems like they're wanting to have this coalition against the Assyrian army. And what does King Ahaz, so Isaiah approaches King Ahaz and he says, trust in God, have faith in him. Um, and instead, what action does King Ahaz choose? Do you remember what? What do you say? Yeah, yeah, go to the Assyrians. Uh, so he, he uh, says, I'm going to be loyal to you. Instead of to God, he's going to be loyal. He's going to be the vassal for the Assyrians. And uh, so he reaches out to Tiglath-Pileser. He gives them this large uh, tribute. And he says, I'm going to be your servant. And as your servant, you need to protect me. Um, and so he doesn't have faith in God. He has faith in man, uh, the king of Assyria, the Assyrian army, and instead of placing his trust in God. And what we see in, so these are chapter 7, 8, and, and 9, talks about uh, there's, uh, there's some hope with this descendant of David, this uh, messianic text about this uh, prince of peace, this wonderful counselor. And then the second part of chapter 9 and the first part of chapter 10, we see this judgment and punishment announced to which nation? Israel. That's right. Because of why? Aren't, isn't Israel God's people? Why would he punish his people? Right. Discipline. It is a punishment. They have left God for uh, the pagan idolatry, the pagan religions that uh, God brought Israel in to destroy and to abolish. And instead they have taken up the same type of religions of the nations, same type of practices. And, uh, and so that's what we see uh, God doing here is is bring the Assyrian army to punish the Israelites. And so now we're going to pick up in Isaiah 10 verse 5. 
And now we're going to see some dialogue between, it's kind of this dialogue back and forth between the Assyrian king and God. And God is not very pleased with the Assyrians and and they're on different pages. And we'll see that here in chapter 10, again, beginning in verse 5. And we're going to start from the viewpoint of the Assyrians, the Assyrian king. And then we'll move on to God's reaction. Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against the people who anger me to seize loot and snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. But this is not what he intends. This is not what he has in mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations. All right. So again, we see that they're they're not on the same page. God says, I have a, a specific intent for him, and that is to punish Israel. But he wants to go beyond my will. He wants to go past these boundaries that I've put in place and uh, so he begins verse 5 with this woe, what sorrow, what, what dread is about to befall the Assyrians. Yes, they are the rod of my anger. Yes, they are the club of my wrath to punish, to discipline my people. But he is going beyond what I want him uh, to become. We see uh, in verse uh, six there, seize loot, snatch, snatch plunder. I don't know if you remember, but uh, Isaiah, you'll probably recall, Isaiah has some strange names that he gives his sons. And one of them is Mahir Shala Hashbaz, that we talked about. Does anyone remember what that means? Yeah, so it, it means uh, the spoil speeds, prey hastens, or we use kind of the colloquial kind of version would be quick pickings, easy prey. And so we see some of that language here as a fulfillment of this name that Isaiah gives his, his child, the seize loot, snatch plunder, quick pickings, easy prey. All right, verse eight, this is, this is what uh, the king of Assyria is saying. He says, not, are, are not all my commanders all kings? So he says, I, here I am, I, I'm king of, of kings. I am the king of kings. So right off the bat, we see that he holds, holds himself in high regard. In verse 10, my hand seized the kingdoms. So I go around and I conquer all these kingdoms. I am king of kings. Verse 11, shall I not deal with Jerusalem and her images as I dealt with Samaria and her idols? I can destroy Jerusalem if I want. I can do whatever I want because I am king of kings. There are no boundaries for me. Well, God has a different viewpoint. So we're going to get to God's response. And this this imagery that he uses about an axe. And uh, you have the lumberjack. And which one is greater? Can the axe boast power? Greater power than the person who uses it. Verse 12. When the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart, the haughty look in his eyes. For he says, by the strength of my hand I have done this, and by my wisdom, because I have understanding I removed the boundaries of nations. I plundered their treasures. Like a mighty one, I subdued their kings. As one reaches into a nest, so my hand reaches for the wealth of the nations. As men gather abandoned eggs, so I gathered all the countries. Not one flapped a wing or opened its mouth to chirp. All right, so again, we see this this mentality of the king of Assyria. And what is it? Yeah, I've done this myself. This is because of me. Uh, I am great and I can do whatever I want. I have unlimited power. There is no boundary for me. I am king of kings. And uh, so this is a very 
prideful, arrogant attitude. And what is God's response to this attitude? Right there in verse 12. Is he going to tolerate it? No. I'm going to punish you. Uh, You're going beyond uh, what I have intended you to go beyond. Uh, You're not invincible. And so, uh, you know, we might use the phrase, uh, he uses this this illustration of of someone taking eggs uh, from birds and they aren't even flapping a wing. There's no kind of fight. It's just easy. Uh, we might use the term, I thought of, uh, it's stealing ca- candy from a baby. You know, this, there's no fight. I can do whatever I want is his mentality. And God says, no, uh, I'm going to punish you for going beyond uh, what uh, is my plan for you. Verse 15, can the axe boast greater than the person who uses it? Is the saw greater than the person who saws? Can a rod strike unless a hand moves it? Can a wooden cane walk by itself? All right, who is the axe and who's the person who wields it in this illustration? What is God saying here? Yeah, God's saying, I I am the lumberjack. I'm the one that's actually cutting down the trees. You are my instrument. You are my tool. And and so who made you great? I made you great. Who gives you the power that you have? I'm the one that gives you the power. And so you need to put yourself in the place that you're supposed to be in. And, uh, And so we see that here. And kind of this humorous illustration, you know, can a wooden cane walk by itself? Uh, a rod is simply a, a, a stick on the ground unless someone picks it up and uses it as a weapon. Uh, I thought of Romans 13, the, the passage where Paul writes that all authority comes from God. And so clearly here, uh, the Assyrian king is not king of all kings. He has whatever boundaries God wants to put, he will put and establish and So there's going to be some humiliation uh, brought about, some punishment on this king. Verse 16, therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts of armies will send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors. Under his pomp, a fire will be kindled like a blazing flame. The light of Israel will become a fire, their holy one a flame. In a single day it will burn and consume his thorns and his briars. The splendor of his forests and the fertile fields it will completely destroy. As when a sick man wastes away. And the remaining trees of his forest will be so few that a child could write them down. So very quickly we see God's response is, is harsh. It's, it's uh, vivid. In this kind of imagery, uh, we see that the thorns and thistles, the the least in Assyria, the least in in the Assyrian army, the weakest, to the strongest, to the greatest, is going to be destroyed. The forest and fertile fields. So all of it is going to be punished. Uh, only a few surviving soldiers, it says the remaining trees of his forest will be so few that a child could write them down. Now there may be even an illusion how he's going to destroy this army. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 19 talks about uh, Sennacherib coming and going to attack Jerusalem and Hezekiah is king, so this is Ahaz, King Ahaz's uh, son that's ruling at this time. But it says that the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next day, they found corpses everywhere. So possibly this is actually a disease that comes in a single day. So there might be some literal uh, 
uh, instead of this being kind of a figurative text, this might be more literal uh, when he says, I, I will send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors. But here we see in the, this moment that God shows up and kills uh, these Assyrian soldiers in the mass. So again, God is in control, not the king of Assyria. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. God is in com- complete control. Uh, the, the comment was uh, that, that God is in con- complete, complete control and he uses good people and bad people to further accomplish his will in, in various ways. The Assyrian king here is, is not a great person. He's arrogant, he's prideful, and yet God is using him as a, a rod to punish his people. And... Uh, yet, again, God is in control. And so we need to choose how are we going to let him use us? Are we going to be instruments for his good and his glorification? Are we going to have these hardened, prideful, arrogant hearts and, and say, I can do this on my own. Uh, I'm going to live for me and to gain glory and power for me. Uh, so we have this choice. Either way, God is going to use us. He is the lumberjack. We are simply the tool in his hand. All right, any other comments or questions? All right, uh, we're going to kind of start another section here. And this is a section about the remnant. It's also uh, focused on this descendant of David, this root or this branch of David. And uh, so we will see that here in the last section that we'll look at this morning. Verse 20. In that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. Though your people, O Israel, be like the sand by the sea, only a remnant will return. Destruction has been decreed, overwhelming and righteous. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, will carry out the destruction decreed upon the whole land. All right, so uh, again, we have the name of one of Isaiah's sons, uh, Shear Jashub. Does anyone remember what that name means, if we translate that. A a, a remnant will return, yes. And so here we have this similar language. This remnant is going to return. Now, this is good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? The bad news? What's the bad news to, to thinking and considering a remnant? Though your numbers are like the sand by the sea, what's going to happen? Just a few are going to survive this, that, that's going to endure, to come back. There's just a small remnant. So that's the bad news. What's the good news? I heard some. Yeah, they're, they aren't going to be completely eliminated. There is going to be a, a, a people. There is going to be this remnant that survive and uh, flourish. And so there's this good news and bad news uh, with this remnant. Sure, sure. I, I believe you're referring to um, in, in the Old Testament where uh, there's a rebellion against, and I can't remember his name, but a rebellion against Moses, uh, Korah. 
That's right. And uh, the rebellion of Korah and, and his followers, they rebel. And you'll recall that God opens up and swallows the people that are against his leader. Um, and if you think about it, there's always been a remnant, right? There's, there's Noah and his family with the flood. Uh, there's uh, other occasions. Uh, let me see. I think I have a few on here. Um, Well, Noah and, and the flood, I, I don't see it here, but uh, Noah and the flood, um, and uh, you can see that there, there are a few from the many that are truly loyal to God, that their hearts are with him, and, uh, and he is with them. So uh, there's this relationship, uh, this remnant that exists. Uh, Paul also talks about a remnant in, in Romans 9 uh, about a remnant. So this even carries on into uh, throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, this idea of a remnant. And that's what we see here in this text. All right, uh, continuing on, verse 24. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty... We're seeing this phrase over and over again in this text. This is the Lord, oh, the Lord Almighty, the, the, the Yahweh of, of many armies. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says, O oh, my people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians who beat you with a rod and lift up a club against you as Egypt did. Very soon my anger against you will end and my wrath will be directed to their destruction. So again, don't be afraid. I'm with you. And there's going to be a remnant. There are going to be survivors. You aren't going to be completely wiped out. Trust in me. He talks about the, the Midianites and uh, the Egyptians as, as the Israel uh, exodus out of Egypt. Verse 27, in that day their burden will be lifted from your shoulders, their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you've grown so fat. Uh, and so this idea that they've, they've eaten so well that they, they're able to break free from this yoke, this bondage of the Assyrian rule. Now it does talk about... Uh, in verse 28, the, the, this pathway that the Assyrians take, and we aren't going to read all these uh, different towns that are written here. Uh, here's a map that just kind of an idea of where these towns are and the approach that the Assyrian army is, is portrayed here to take. Uh, now, this might be more of imagery than what actually occurs. I, I haven't been to this area. I know some of you have, but apparently this, this kind of path would have been very difficult for a large army. It would have been a, a tough uh, a terrain to cross. Uh, in any case, in Isaiah 36, we find out that the king of Assyria, this is Sennacherib, he sends his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. So they attack uh, from the direction of Egypt, uh, from Lachish. So it would have been southwest of Jerusalem that they uh, make this approach. So in, in any case, it seems like this imagery is that the Assyrians are coming and they're coming with a big force and... Yet God is going to be with them because we see in verse 32, this day they will halt at Nob, they will shake their fists at the mount of the daughter of Zion at the hill of Jerusalem. But look, the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord Almighty will chop down the mighty tree of Assyria with great power. He will cut down the proud, that lofty tree will be brought down. He will cut down the forest trees with an axe. Lebanon will fall to the mighty one. So Lebanon, known for its, its great trees, uh, even the greatest will be cut down. None will stand before the Lord Almighty, the Lord of heaven's armies. All right, more about this, this uh, remnant in chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, and, and their ruler, this descendant from 
David or Jesse here. Verse 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. All right, so we have more of this tree imagery. This is a major theme throughout Isaiah, but uh, there's trees getting cut down. And then here we have Judah, a cut down tree, and yet there uh, is still life in the tree. And there is a branch, a shoot that comes from the stump of Jesse. And what does it say about this branch, this descendant, this future ruler of The remnant of Israel. What's he going to be like? Is he going to be like all the previous rulers and all the the, the previous kings that we've read about? Yeah, the spirit of the Lord is on him, which we, we have seen in the past. We have David as an example. The spirit of the Lord comes on David. So possibly a correlation there. But... Certainly, this is the ultimate ruler. He has wisdom, spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of power, of knowledge. Like these other, unlike these other kings who had fear of the Assyrians, of, of, of other nations, the Egyptians, they were afraid. Uh, we read that they, they trembled like trees in the wind, shaking in their boots. Here, this king, his fear is in God. His delight is in the fear of God. How does he judge? Well, he judges with, with fairness, with righteousness. He judges uh, and cares for the needy. He gives justice instead of this injustice. And uh, what kind of fighting is done? He talks about slaying the wicked, but how does he slay the wicked? How does he strike the earth? Yes, with words, right? This isn't the sword that he's taking up. This isn't spears and shields. It's with the words from his mouth that he is is attacking and defeating wickedness. Righteousness will be his belt, faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Um. So just as the Lord creates by the breath of his mouth... His word, so the king's weapons here is against wickedness, the rod of his mouth, the breath of his lips. All right, part of some more of this imagery that we've seen in previous chapters, we have this imagery of peace in this time. Verse 6, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf, the lion, with the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We've talked about already in chapter 9, this prince of peace. And what we see here is very contradictory you have a wolf and a lamb lying down together uh, in, in peace. There's this, this comfort and peace that comes with this ruler. Unlike the, anything that we've seen before. All right, verse 10. In the day of the root of, Z- of Jesse will stand as a banner. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to bring back the remnant of his people. So here again, he's bringing his people, this remnant, uh, for him. We've seen uh, him, God, raise a banner before, and that was 
If you recall that he's bringing all these nations against his people. And now he's raising this banner for all the nations to gather the exiles of Israel. To assemble the scattered people back to Judah for this time of, of peace and prosperity. And here they are, have this strength and power. We see um, here later... Oh, uh, here uh, we have this. He will raise a banner for the nations and, and gather the exiles. Verse 12, he will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Then at last, the jealousy between Israel and Judah will end. They will not be rivals anymore. So again, this imagery of peace. Verse 14, they will join forces to swoop down on Philistia. And we aren't going to read all these different kingdoms that they're going to to overpower. Uh, again, the idea is that they, they have this strength and this power along with this inner peace. In verse 16, he will make a highway for the remnant of his people, the remnant coming from Assyria, just as he did for Israel long ago when they return from Egypt. And so from all over the earth, the four quarters of the earth, there's no part of earth too far for God's hand to reach. Here, uh, he's going to reach out a second time and, and bring them back up to him and, and have this relationship once again with his people. And, uh, and so there's this, this, again, imagery of peace, of prosperity, of, of joy and happiness. They have this wonderful ruler. There's this remnant that has come from all corners of the earth. And uh, so just a wonderful imagery. We've seen already in Isaiah quite a bit of death and destruction, despair, uh, gloominess. But here we have this hope presented, this salvation that is, is going to come through this uh, uh, shoot from the, the, the stump of Jesse, a branch from the roots. All right, we're going to see in just a moment, chapter 12, the reaction of the remnant, this, this praise, this rejoicing. Uh, any comments, questions up to this point? Right, right, and and a lot of prophecies uh, have dual meanings. So there is actually a remnant that will come back from Assyria, uh, really Babylonian captivity. Uh, if we're talking about Judah, they do come back. Um, but ultimately, as we see throughout the New Testament, this applies to who? Who is the the, the root of Jesse? Who is this remnant that Paul talks about? A physical one or a spiritual one? A spiritual one. That's right. So uh, there, there is this ultimate uh, fulfillment in Christ, this ultimate fulfillment in his people, his church. And this is what we see the New Testament writers referring to, talking about uh, Jesus throughout the New Testament talks, uh, refers to himself as, as the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And so we see this uh, connection made with these messianic texts in Isaiah. Right, right. So God is in control. He is all powerful. He can make the, the wolf and the lamb lie down together. Uh, but again, the, the, the point or, or the imagery that's being presented here is one of peace, of unity. And these are the things that this descendant of David will bring. All right.
Chapter 12, in that day you will say, I will praise you, O Lord, although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. And proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud. Sing for joy. People of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. All right, so what is the reaction from these people who have, this remnant that have been saved? Right, so they're praising the Lord. They, they, they're a new people. They weren't like uh, the, the previous people that uh, were afraid of, of these armies and afraid of, of fleshly things and, and not afraid of God and not acknowledging his power. And, uh, and so here's this new people, this remnant that has this relationship with God, who fears God, has this relationship with him, and praises his name for all the good that he has done. There are some echoes here of Exodus and the song of Moses in Exodus 15. And uh, so uh, again, what we see here in this text is a people that have rebelled against God. God reaches out and, and, um, and provides salvation for this remnant, and they've dedicated their lives, they've responded to, to God's outreach, and, and now they have trust in God and uh, this relationship with him, and we see that here in this text. And throughout the Old Testament, you have punishment, you have a repentant people, God reaching out again, and um, starting this relationship with them uh, once again. And uh, we see that here in this text. All right, uh, I have some questions and maybe some more applications in a moment, but I want to offer up an opportunity for anyone to have any questions or further thoughts in these chapters. I know we covered a lot of material, a lot more could be said uh, about any of this. Um, so anyone have anything that they would like to say? All right. Right. Yeah, there's this imagery uh, in the New Testament about uh, purifying through the fire, refining gold through the fire. And, and God is constantly refining nations and people. He's refining us. And, and so if we give our hearts to him, he will. And it's not always pleasant. It's not always easy. But it, the end result is, is a better me because God knows what he is doing. If, if we let him, if we open up our hearts, join in a relationship with him, he's going to change our lives and it will be for the better. Right, yeah. Righteous and just destructions, yeah, in chapter 10. Right. 
so, so the comment made is that, uh, that, that God is in control of all things and he's working on all of us. We're all his instruments. And part of him working in our lives includes discipline and punishment. And uh, there's that passage that we read in chapter 10, that this is a righteous judgment. This is a, a righteous punishment that is being carried out. Which, in my mind, I, I jump to, and there's so many texts that you can jump to, but my, my, my mind jumps to uh, the letter Hebrews, and it talks about a father. A father who loves his child does what? Disciplines his children. And so this is God out of his love. And we can see mercy here. What does Judah deserve? Here they are sacrificing their children to idol. They've rejected God. They're living immoral lives. They don't care about the needy. They don't care about the poor. They're heartless. They're prideful, arrogant. What does Judah deserve? Death, complete destruction. And yet God says, no, I'm going to spare a, a part of you. There is going to be this remnant. And what do we deserve? All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. What, do we, what, what does sin bring? Death, destruction, and yet God is reaching out to us with mercy and love. All right, we'll see. Yes. Also, evidence that among the people who are used to destroy God's people when they're evil, there's the evidence that among them, they, they, they have some that believe in our salvation. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, so Rahab is an example. Uh, let me ask you this question, since you brought that up. Um, who did Jonah go? Who was Jonah sent to? Nineveh. And what is Nineveh? What city is uh, Nineveh? C capital of Assyria. So does God care about the Assyrians? Yeah, the answer is yes. He does care about the Assyrians too. Um, now there's a special relationship between him and Israel. But uh, clearly God cares about all people and uses all people as his instruments. What we want him to do is mold us as instruments for his glory. Um, and so that's a, a takeaway that we can have this morning. Thank you for your participation.